Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jared Baton to ECHO. Jared's given talks here before, and Jared is on faculty here in the Departments of Global Health, Medicine, Infectious Disease, and Epidemiology, and he is an expert on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, and I will turn it over to him for an update on that topic. I could afternoon, I guess, everybody, and thanks for coming. I'm going to talk about uh, an update on PrEP for HIV prevention, and I've got about 15 minutes of slides that'll give a good snapshot, and then I think there's time for questions at the end. Great. Okay. So I've crafted some um, discrete objectives for what we want to be learning. I want to summarize the evidence supporting PrEP as an effective HIV prevention strategy to um, understand the importance of adherence to PrEP for effective prevention, um, which uh, I guess sort of goes without saying, but is, but is a very important um, uh, concept in the, in the research around this field. And then to review the basic prescribing information related to PrEP for prevention and point towards resources for additional information on prescribing. So as, as background for uh, individuals who are, who are unfamiliar with PrEP, the idea is that an HIV uninfected person who is at high risk of infection would take an antiretroviral medication before potential exposure. And as a result of the, the presence of medications in bloodstream or tissues or wherever it's important that HIV be blocked, the virus may be unable to establish infection, sort of analogous to the little virus bouncing off the person at the bottom right of the corner, uh, by, bottom right hand corner of the screen. The idea of providing a medication for prophylaxis against an infectious disease, of course, is a well-established one, and I think many of us have taken or prescribed or both um, malaria prophylaxis when we travel. There are certainly many other examples of prophylaxis against infectious diseases, many of, uh, many of which apply directly to HIV, of course, where we have used prophylaxis against infections for um, opportunistic infections. PrEP is similar but differs from post-exposure prophylaxis in important ways. An individual may be exposed to HIV, and has a chance of developing HIV infection. Post-exposure prophylaxis initiated ideally um, in a short period after, after potential exposure, um, and certainly initiated, uh, um, uh, certainly with better efficacy, likely if initiated as early as possible after exposure, has the opportunity to block HIV infection from taking hold. Pre-exposure prophylaxis extends the prophylactic period earlier to be sometime before HIV infection, before the uh, HIV ex infection exposure takes place, and blankets the period from both before and the period afterwards, um, um, thus similarly reducing the risk of HIV infection, potentially redu reducing the risk of HIV infection even more because the prophylactic medication is in the bloodstream or tissues before the infection uh, ex exposure occurs. For individuals with ongoing repeated exposures to HIV, post-exposure prophylaxis may be insufficient as they may um, not cover all exposure periods um, because many exposures may be unrecognized or unacknowledged, and um, certainly serial post-exposure prophylaxis is challenging to administer. Pre-exposure prophylaxis may be easier for individuals who have periods of high risk in their lives, periods that are time-limited where post-pre-exposure prophylaxis could be used um, to reduce the risk of infection during those periods. There's a pretty substantial evidence base now for pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention. There are four randomized clinical trials um, done in diverse, both geographic and at-risk populations, heterosexuals, men who have sex with men, and injection drug users from, um, from four continents that have demonstrated the efficacy of PrEP for HIV prevention. With efficacy estimates ranging from 44% in the IPREX trial among men who have sex with men to 75% in the Partners PrEP study among heterosexual couples, um, individuals who were at risk of HIV infection because of a known heterosexual HIV positive partner. As we'll hear about on the next slides, uh, probably the greatest driver of this difference in efficacy is utilization of the study medication during the randomized, randomized trial. But the d data are pretty, uh, are definitive across these four studies. In our own Partners PrEP study, a uh, study that was conducted, uh, that was led out of here at the University of Washington, we also demonstrated that for the highest risk subgroups of populations, um, including groups of higher risk women, efficacy was very high. Um, so demonstrating that PrEP works for individuals who are at high risk of infection and high risk infection for multiple, re for multiple um, reasons, either because they're, uh, they're women living with an HIV positive partner or women who have a positive partner and may be at increased risk of infection because of higher HIV exposure, younger age, or other factors. 
As demonstrated in this, um, in, in this table, the degree of HIV efficacy in the randomized placebo comparison in the right-hand column is, was really quite proportional and tightly tied to the degree of, 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 of utilization of PrEP in the, in the randomized trial. So in individuals who had been randomized in the clinical trial to the active PrEP arms, detection of tenofovir, one of the active moieties for PrEP, was, was, compar was very comparable to the degree of, of protection in the randomized comparison. As noted in blue at the bottom, two randomized trials conducted among higher risk women in Southern Africa demonstrated no HIV protection in the context of very low utilization across the clinical trial population of the product, less than 30 percent. What's, what's very interesting is that secondary analyses within these trials have tried to tease out if individuals had been highly adherent, as now in this additional right-hand column, what HIV protection would be like, and it's on the order of 80 to 90 or, ni or even greater than 90 percent. So in individuals who had, who had true adherence to the pr prophylactic medication, um, degree of HIV pre protection may be extremely high. There's a tremendous amount of safety information for PrEP contained in the randomized trials, and I've just summarized it um, uh, briefly here. Rates of death, serious adverse events, and laboratory abnormalities, including renal dysfunction, which is an important factor for, for use of tenofovir, were low and not significantly different between those taking PrEP and those assigned placebo. And PrEP was generally well tolerated, so things that don't rise to the level of serious adverse events but are, but are adverse events or side effects. They were they, uh, related to PrEP occurred in the minority of subjects, were primarily gastrointestinal adverse events that were more common in those receiving PrEP than in placebo, but occurred in, only in the minority, a true minority of individuals, reported in less than 10 percent of an individuals assigned to PrEP, um, and in a relatively similar pr proportion, though slightly lower, of those assigned to placebo, and primarily during the first month of therapy, um, something that might be expected with initiating a new medication. Uh, styles that were able to measure bone density um, found that tenofovir-related PrEP was associated with a small change of bone mineral density but without increased risk of fracture, certainly a topic that will be um, studied for, that will needs additional um, study and probably study for individuals most importantly who have long-term use of, of this medication rather than time-limited use. In the randomized trials, there was no evidence of risk compensation, um, in fact, uh, or, or uh, the idea that people would uh, change their sexual behavior as a result of taking a prophylactic medication. In fact, um, unprotected, uh, unprotected sex on the left-hand side in the IPREX study, unprotected uh, receptive anal sex, or on the right-hand side in the heterosexual study, unprotected vaginal sex, actually went down during the course of the study, um, perhaps because of being reminded uh, when taking PrEP or being re reminded at periodic clinic visits that HIV protection also also um, involves behavior change. Antiretroviral resistance, as indicated in, in the middle column, did not occur in clinical trials of PrEP um, for individuals who were infected after enrollment, with the, the sole exception for antiretroviral resistance for individuals who had seronegative acute infection at the time of enrollment in the, in the right-hand column, um, who, thus who were already HIV infected when they were started on PrEP medication. The middle column, the, the row of zeros, uh, likely indicates that those individuals who became infected in the randomized trials, for the most part, were not adherent to PrEP, and there's no, um, there, there's very little, there's no way to, do, to um, uh, select for antiretroviral resistance when there is no drug pressure, of course. In July of 2012, the US FDA approved a fixed-dose combination of tenofovir and tricytabine as PrEP in combination with safer sex practices to reduce the risk of sexually acquired HIV infection in adults of high risk. Um, the, the approved label for this combination medication says that it must be used by individuals who are confirmed to be HIV negative through some amount of, of HIV testing prior to starting and recommended at least every three months during use. The only pr approved prescribing is for once daily dosing, and there is no evidence for any other prescribing frequency, intermittent use of any sort, although, uh, um, although there is quite a bit of research to try to define if less frequent use of PrEP would be both, um, could both m increase the adherence but also uh, while providing comparable um, HIV protection. And um, uh, the manufacturer of, of, of combination of tricinabine tenofovir has a training education program to assist providers in counseling interventions who, uh, and counseling individuals who are receiving or considering PrEP. And there's very good information available online uh, in a relatively easy way to find this.
CDC, and these are two documents um, on the right from the MMWR, has, per, has um, described, uh, has re released interim guidance for clinicians for prescribing um, pre-exposure prophylaxis for individuals who are at high risk because they're men who have sex with men, who are heterosexuals at high risk for infection, and then not shown here all as well as for injection drug users who are at high risk of HIV infection. The basic eligibility is HIV negative, adequate renal function, and um, hepatitis B testing, and certainly for most populations who are at high risk of HIV, hepatitis B vaccination. Follow would be prescribing for daily use with periodic HIV testing and counseling about risk reduction. And most importantly, pre-exposure prophylaxis is very different than antiretroviral treatment in that um, lifelong therapy is not to be expected, but to be, to be uh, for bracketing periods of highest risk. And I, uh, for individuals who are interested in prescribing PrEP, these are actually, the, the MSM document is the most detailed because it was the first released, and then the other two for heterosexuals and IDUs refer back to it. And it's um, a very good document to, to just get the basics of how to, to check through of how to prescribe pre-exposure prophylaxis for prevention. And they're very, um, they're, uh, very pragmatic clinical guidelines. One question we, I receive a lot is the use of PrEP for uh, reducing periconception risk reduction. The, this, of course, will never be studied in a, in, a ran, in a humongous randomized trial in the way that other things, in the way that the efficacy of PrEP was discovered, but there is um, there's a fair evidence base so far. In the clinical trials of PrEP, PrEP was discontinued at the time of pregnancy, and thus there is um, a fairly good amount of information about its use during the time of periconception. There was no evidence in those studies for decreased pregnancy incidence, increased birth de defects, adverse pregnancy outcomes, or slower infant growth in those receiving PrEP versus placebo. And this is in concert with the information from the antiretroviral pregnancy registry, for, which has been used, of course, for um, women with HIV infection who, who have used antiretrovirals, including tenofovir and emtricetabine, for HIV treatment. The package label for combination FTC-DDF for PrEP says that there is limited data available, for as it does probably for most um, medications in the United States, uh, but um, human and animal data do not suggest increases in the risk of major birth defects. And if an uninfected individual becomes pregnant while taking PrEP, um, so that's at, so, uh, so after be conception is achieved, PrEP could be continued with careful consideration given to um, ongoing HIV risk even during pregnancy. And so it's a very good clinical opportunity for, for discussing periconception use of PrEP, for example, for a woman with an HIV positive partner and to minimize HIV risk during pregnancy requires a lot of discussion and then even potentially continuing to decrease the risk of acute infection, which of course would be very serious during pregnancy. So in summary, and I think I'm on time, to answer the uh, initial points, I wanted to summarize the evidence supporting PrEP as an effective prevention strategy. I think we have very good evidence that PrEP has been proven to prevent HIV acquisition of persons at high risk for acquiring the virus, including persons who have um, uh, uh, different opportunities for pr pr uh, acquiring the virus because of risk behavior. In the United States, combination emtricetabine tenofovir is approved. Um, in combination with safer sex practices and risk reduction for HIV prevention. And so there is a, la there is a, there is a formal in label indication for prescription of this medication. One of our goals was to understand the importance of adherence for PrEP for HIV prevention, and of course adherence to is key for PrEP efficacy. I think this, um, to some degree, this goes without saying it, adherence to any medication is key to its efficacy. I think this has been um, uh, particularly well studied for antiretroviral medications, both for treatment and now for prophylaxis, that one has to use them for, the, for them to have benefit. And I reviewed the basic prescribing information related to PrEP for HIV prevention, including risk assessment, which is, of course, the most, uh, which is, of course, sometimes the most challenging aspect of uh, delivering primary care services, HIV testing, once daily dosing, the only, pr the only approved prescribing method, and ongoing monitoring, um, specifically with attention to HIV testing, and periodic monitoring of renal function. Thank you.